And then there was an earthquake. And my grandma was like, where's grandpa? And he was outside lying on his side, um, looking at the corridor because you could see it like um, moving in the earthquake. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's quite funny. Everyone else was trying to hide under a table or whatever. And he was outside (laughs) watching his house in the earthquake. Hello there. My name is Kit Rackley, my pronouns are they, them, and this is Coffee and Geography. The aim of the show is to get to know, explore, and celebrate the diverse and intersectional range of people on this rock we call home, and their love and passions of it. We'll find out why guests identify as geographers, and if they don't exactly, We'll have fun exploring all the myriad of ways that connects their life to geography. So, pour your favourite brew, get cosy and listen in. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at Coffee Jog Pot. Off we go. Hello everybody. Now, um, I'm going to apologise in advance to all listeners and my guests, actually, because I might get emotional or nostalgic during this chat, because I'm not only delighted... I'm also so proud to have with me today someone I've actually known since she was a bright-eyed 11-year-old student just starting high school, (laughs) Johanna (laughs) Bonilla Allard. How time flies. Hi, how are you? Yeah, it seems like a long old time ago now starting at Fram, but... Oh my goodness. So we were just, we were all doing our pre-prep chat and catch up before we start, and you said you left at what, 2013, so it's uh, eight years ago now. Um... My how things have changed since then, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um, so everybody, um, what's going to be so lovely about this chat is w- when you listen to it is that uh, most of this is actually going to be like me and Johanna catching up as well, which is beautiful. So it's going to be a very very organic chat, and uh, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as as much as uh, well. At least I know how I am anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you'll enjoy it too, Johanna. So to introduce you to everybody, you are um, part Costa Rican, part Mexican, part Californian. Part Norfolk girl living in Yorkshire. No, I did that right. <laughs> <laughs> Currently studying for a, a, a master's in M- MSc in sustainability. Now, when you're not studying, she spends most of her time riding and racing her bike all over the place, as it's Johanna's favourite way to explore and appreciate nature. And with a love of bikes and a passion for sustainability, jo- Johanna hopes to eventually end up working in sustainable transport. Now, there's so much to cover there, but I'm only just finding out about the Mexican bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's news to me so yeah i will come back to that because uh we'll talk about your sense of place and your identity because of course <laughs> that's what we talk about i know you got a bottle of water with you this, this evening because um you're you're very like, health conscious and i'm quite naughty i've got my caffeine free coffee here but do you drink any tea or coffee usually sometimes maybe oh yeah i'm a big coffee fan uh. um <laughs> i I didn't really like it when I was younger. It took me a while to warm to it. Um, but I au paired in Spain um, when I was 19. And the family there, obviously, were huge coffee drinkers. Um, so they were absolutely disgusted to hear that I didn't drink coffee. <laughs> um, so even the kids who were like 12 or 13 even had a bit of coffee every now and then. So I've been hooked <laughs> since. <laughs> uh, you know what, I've... I was going to say 12, but then again, we've caught our youngest, you know, sneaking a bit of sip from my wife's coffee in the morning and uh, looking over in that rice smile when, you know, <laughs> I think we got a coffee. It's it's, 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 it's my wife's side of the family thing, my, my mother-in-law, my wife, and now I think my youngest is like, a <laughs> like hook it up to my veins kind of thing. But um, do you have a particular uh, um, brand or, or kind of one that you, you go to? Most strong coffees I like. Um uh I say I normally go for the Sainsbury's really strong I think it's a five rate of five um their coffee um I also like um well my bike team so I ride for a bike team and um they're sponsored by a Yorkshire based um coffee um producer called Darkwood so I also have that sometimes which is really good okay Um, great so that's that's two to two to add to the map then and uh there you go, listeners. Um, challenge for you then. Which of the two is the more sustainable out of those? Yeah. <laughs> go and get cracking and, and tell us. Right. Great. So um, now we're definitely, definitely going to talk about this. This is amazing because I just learning for this for the first time, this whole Mexican part thing. But OK. Right. Let me ask the question properly. So 
as it said in the intro, you said part Costa Rican, part Mexican, part Californian, part Norfolk, and now you're living in Yorkshire. Where are you going to start when I say how, you know, what aspects of each of those like form your identity now? Do you still carry, is there any part of that culture? Because I know that you've not like lived in some of these places for a lot of your life, but is there anything that's kind of like been instilled through your parents or that you've took take with you? What bits of Norfolk have you taken up to Yorkshire with you? I mean, oh, crikey, you start anywhere you like, Johanna. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've absolutely loved it my whole life, having such a variety of um, cultures sort of, um, yeah, that I've been exposed to. I'd say mostly sort of my Californian um, <laughs> cultural blood is that kind of, yeah, I'm very proud of that, I guess. And then up here in um, Yorkshire, I mean, I do love the good Yorkshire folk. They're very friendly. <laughs> um, but I definitely feel like I'm a bit of an adopted Yorkshire woman. Um, so, yeah, I'm still very proud to be a Norfolk girl as well. But, I mean, Sheffield's a great city. I absolutely love Sheffield. It's really green. Um, I think it has the highest um, ratio of trees to people in Europe. Um, oh. So I do love Sheffield. Um but going back to California, um, so my grandparents live in California um, and we go back, um, well, we try to go every couple of years, but um, obviously that's a bit harder now, I'm a bit older, mm. but it really does feel like I'm going home. Um, they live in a small, I guess it's, yeah, like a town on the outskirts of LA, um, which has a huge port um, and is very like, a lot of fishing goes on there. And that's sort of how my family moved there. Um, so the Mexican part, my grandpa's um, from Mexico and they ran a hotel um, in a place called Puebla in Mexico. Um, a very famous hotel, actually. Um, lots of movies were filmed there. Um, and my grandpa could swim before he could walk because he just spent the whole time in the hotel swimming pool. <laughs> um, but sadly, um, it kind of, yeah, things went downhill. Um, and so they needed to look like my grandparents or well, their parents needed to look for work. So moved to San Pedro because the port was such like a huge employer um, and like loads of jobs were there. It was huge, like rapidly expanding. Um, so they moved there. Didn't speak a word of English. Yeah. Wow. Um, so say so that's the first time you've told, told me that you kept that quiet because, you know, <laughs> well, I, I've, you know what? I reckon I, I reckon I know why, because you probably would have thought I'm not going to tell tell you because you're going to make it some part of a lesson or something like that and like, <laughs> but um that's that's a really really cool story and actually the, the guest before you you know is in Irvine um just out on the outskirts of LA so that's what's what's so what's so incredible is that I'm trying to obviously get guests from all over the world but it's just it's just coincidence that that we've got the previous guest is on the outskirts of LA and then we've got you with that link to the outskirts of LA a slightly different part of, of LA and you've got all these other links as well and we're bringing it all back to it's just amazing how we're on how globalized we've become in that sense um in terms of a community that if you if you perhaps take yeah take away the personal side of things and you go by say location region then we probably are all only separated by two or three degrees from from each other it's, it's incredible yeah the California there so I mean I've I've always yeah, since since I've known you, I've I've always kind of got that vibe from you, that kind of very outdoorsy, you know, love you know, very sporty kind of person. Um, like uh, you were on the you were on the girls' football team that I coached, <laughs> which was amazing. You were my, I think I played you on the right wing, didn't I? I think maybe the left wing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're on the wingers, and uh, oh, I tell you what, I can't. I'm never ever. I'm, I'm a bit like I feel a bit like Gareth Southgate in a way because. And yeah, I, I don't know if I should be bringing this memory up, but do you remember? I, I think I we had we certainly had the best team in Norfolk. We had a strong team, yeah. It was a strong team. There was yourself. There was, and I don't. They'd probably not be listening, but we'll give them a shout out. There was Lucy. There was Charlie. There was uh, Rebecca, our captain. Mm, Meg, um, Meg, Karis. Yeah, it was such a great team. And what we had like four or five academy players. Yeah. Bless, bless their heart. We had um, we had Charlie in goal for us. And uh, and they just kept lobbing them from the halfway line because they weren't our usual goalkeeper, which is a shame. Yeah. And they, of course, they it was three three, and we went out on penalties. Yeah. You know, and the manager came over to me at, at full time and said, "I don't know how we beat you, but <laughs> I'm like, good luck in the final." <laughs> but that was a really good team. Yeah. Um, and I knew that I knew from that point that you just, you just had this like natural sporting ability. So then you, you took up cycling rather than football or soccer then. 
Well, to be honest, I've done pretty much every sport under the sun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'd say during my high school days, I literally did every sport. You every lunchtime, every team, yeah. I was yeah doing a different sport. Um, I also ran quite competitively, which I still love running. Like, I think it's a great way to explore, like, off-road. I just get lost in my own thoughts. Um, and, yeah, I still love it. But then I got a bike maybe my second year of university and obviously Sheffield's amazing for cycling I mean a third of the city's in the Peak District so yeah. um you can't really beat it in my opinion <laughs> I don't know I don't know I, was, I mean when I was when I was fittest when I used to cycle to and from work you know yeah, I, yeah. I probably would be able to cycle around um around Sheffield but no not now like with all those hills and everything like that and I just I just so what describe describe to us the way do you, do you like literally like get on your bike and just like ride out or do you get on a train or a bus first and then get on a bike so how, so how do you go about doing that because you're super fit I wouldn't be surprised if you just went from your front door and just went off <laughs> um most of the time it's um just from my door um sh- yeah it's 10 minutes to the peak district from oh, where wow. I live Sheffield is a big city um so yeah. it's a perfect like it can get quite busy in the city so just being able to yeah get on my bike 10 minutes into the countryside not see anyone um I've done so many rides now I know all the secret lanes and quiet back roads that no one else knows nice you're gonna have to um because I I actually do go up to Sheffield um quite often obviously pre-covid because um because of the geographical association which are located on Solly Street and um and so I go up there quite often for like training and doing stuff up there. So, um, so what we'll have to what we'll have to try and do, right? You're hearing it here, everybody, because it's a commitment. It's public. I'll bring up my road bike, right? Um, and you can you can take me on the, some of these these paths. And uh, <laughs> so you must be on the are you kind of like sort of on the west side of Sheffield then? Because the Peak District's to the west of Sheffield, isn't it? So. Yeah, in a place called Crooks, where so it's right on the top of the hill. <laughs> oh, nice! Yeah. So if you want to go into town, you just basically freewheel it, do you? Oh yeah, going into town is so easy. <laughs> it's the coming <laughs> back that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you uh, recall it, but in Norwich, there's um, there's Gas Hill, which is the steep. Which is uh, I don't know what grade it is. Um, you know, you can look it up, everybody. But I used to live uh, in the housing area just on the top of Gas Gas Hill up there. And I and I was I was at my peak fitness when I thought, you know what, just today on the way back from work, I'm just going to go up Gas Hill, you know. And it really is. And then um, they they actually have used to have an event there called the Gas Hill Gasp. Yeah, I've done that before. You've done it. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I knew it. I thought you would have done. <laughs> you you um you must you you would have made it up to the top without getting off your bike, surely. Yeah, it's a really good event. That event. Um, they have all different categories. So they have like um like kids um bmx bikes um i can't remember the other ones any old bike like anyone can enter um and then i was in like the women's one and there's quite a lot of women which is really good to see um yeah it's a really good event <laughs> yeah and um this was before the days i had my road bike i had my steel framed bike so <laughs> i was able to get up it like that so it was quite so i would never it's a toughie, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't even be able to get up there on my road bike now my my carbon bike <laughs> Uh, so yeah okay i've made that promise now and i know you're going to hold me to that yeah i'll hold you to it <laughs> absolutely fantastic obviously you, you love your bikes and things like that and, and we know that um so for everybody listening oh yeah time check we're recording this on the on the first of july uh you're probably hearing this about end of september ish i imagine because of could of all of the amazing guests that i've been talking to but of course, um, we, we know at the moment that we've got that you know the, the tragic um events that are taking taking place in you know, Northern California in Oregon, in Oregon and Washington and, 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 uh, Southwestern Canada with the, with the heat, the heat wave out there. Um, which kind of brings into focus, of course, why sustainability is so exceptionally important because you've got sustainability on, on the local scale. And I know you can tell us a bit about that at the moment because you're doing some amazing things with that kind of respect, like and housing and stuff like that. And then you've got and that all feeds in naturally into the kind of the, the wider, bigger picture scale with things like the climate crisis and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I bring that up just to make sure you know people are aware of that and um, and that what you're doing, the kind of things that you're doing is a fantastic way of fighting the climate crisis. So you're doing a master's in sustainability. Yeah. You love biking. You do it to appreciate nature, which you which we said, 
and you're hoping to work in sustainable transport. So t- tell us a little bit about how your master's, what, what you're doing for your master's and what you're hoping to kind of get out of it and, and go into, because you're on placement as well at the moment, aren't you? So Yeah, I'm on placement at the moment. Um, so if we just sort of take it back a step, um, sure. I think Kit will be quite aware that um, as a teenager, I struggled, struggled quite a lot with sort of um, anxiety surrounding the climate crisis um, and sort of, I know I'm not the only one, there's there's hundreds of people out there. So that overwhelming feeling of like helplessness. And the reason I'm decided to do this master's sort of comes from that, I guess. Um, because yeah, I guess I was kind of looking like at different options about what how I personally can sort of make a difference, get involved and feel like what I'm doing day to day is yeah, helping in the challenges associated with the climate crisis. And I think um so my master's in sustainability covers all those different issues so not just environmental sustainability social sustainability um economic sustainability but how they're all connected like you can't just focus on one and how it needs everyone as well so it's not just individuals it's businesses governments like everyone um so the reason i chose this master's is because it covers it covered all of that and um as Kit mentioned at the moment, um, I'm on placement. Um, so it's part of my master's. Um, so I decided to do my placement with a small, small SME based in Leeds, um, who provide sustainable alternative products to sort of everyday products like cleaning products, household items, things like that. Um, and I'm helping them obtain the B Corp certification, which is really cool because, um, yeah, we really need to get businesses invo- involved if we want to sort of tackle the main sustainability issues out there. <laughs> and it can feel quite overwhelming that I think if every business just sort of, yeah, started looking to things like the B Corp certification, it'd be a really w- good way to start. Yeah, and that, that's good to get. And please, please give give the name of that SME a shout out. Oh, yeah, EcoVibe. Um, EcoVibe. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so a small SME. And I think, and I really, really do think that, I mean, obviously, we know that big multinationals you know, have not just a uh, huge power because of their resources and whatnot, but they've got, they've got huge responsibility as well. And I just think that, um, in my personal opinion, um, uh, be interested to know what you think about this, but, but small and medium sized businesses and enterprises actually can create a sea change. You know, if you get so many SMEs, you know, moving forward in one direction, they actually can dictate, you know, how, you know, the consumer will, will, will treat because a lot more consumers now are looking to SMEs, you know, because they feel it's, you know, supporting the local economy, um, you know, keeping the, keeping the money in the like a circular economy and that kind of stuff. And so, and they can really drive things forward. And a lot of um, people, you know, are turning away from the big ones and thinking, where can I get this locally? So tell us a little bit more about this B Corp, um, accreditation or certification then because that sounds really really interesting i'm just wondering if there's anyone listening there thinking oh this might be something our organization can have a little look at um yeah so it's an um international um certification a private certification is awarded for high high standards of environmental and social and um, performance um so there's sort of three main parts to the accreditation there's like a legal side um and sort of a transparency side um and then the main part is there's a current impact assessment um which has to be undertaken um and what's good about the b corp certification um is this is tailored to the size of the company so um it'll be different like for huge multinational companies and then tiny companies like EcoVibe. So it's a bit more, um, it's a good benchmarking tool as well because companies can compare themselves to others. Um, so the current impact assessment has sort of five main categories. Um, there's in questions on environmental performance, social performance, um, work like uh, treatment of workers, governance. Um, so it's very wide ranging. And yeah, it has to be updated um, every few years. So um, it really does make the company sort of think about their environmental and social performance. This is, I tell you what, everybody listen, you know, because what we do have a, quite a few geography teachers listening, and this looks to me like an amazing educational resource. Um, so I'm just running my eyes down. So they've got a list, like, um, they've got a catalog of uh, a listing of all the companies who've got this, this, um, certification. And yeah, and they give a little like little spiel about what they do, how they do it, um, their impact report, you know, in terms of measuring their sustainability. 
So, oh my goodness. So it's such a wide range of um, sectors and and um, industries in there as well, which is really, really interesting. And they do have a couple of big names there, but most of them are names I don't recognize, which is not a bad thing. It's just what you said about, you know, the small and medium en- uh, size enterprises. No, definitely. Yeah. Right. So everybody do check that out. The link will be in the description and then you can see if um, that'll be a good good little thing for your students to have. Uh, it'd be good for, for an NEA, for a um, non-examined assessment. I think I got that right. I'm getting rusty now that I've not been in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Basically coursework, coursework. <laughs> right. So, but you did, you, but you, you didn't go straight into sustainability though. You did law degree, didn't you? I did. I did do a law degree. I was basically inspired by, I don't know if you are familiar with Christiana Figueres. She basically made the Paris Agreement happen. She's from Costa Rica as well, which, you know, is always an added bonus. Boom. Um, <laughs> She, yeah, she's amazing. She's done so much for the climate crisis. Um, obviously, getting everyone to agree on the Paris Agreement um, is just absolutely amazing. But she now does a podcast, um, which I'd highly recommend. It's called Outrage and Optimism. Um, and it's based on the principles that for the climate crisis, you need outrage, you need to be angry about what's happening. Um, but to move forward, you need optimism and you need hope to bring action um, and there's basically a guest on there um from client earth i don't know if you are you familiar with client earth yep it's just talking about the power of law um and how powerful that can be in sort of changing people's behavior and um, protecting the environment um and like yeah um encouraging action um so thought it was a good way for me to get into um or to make a difference in protecting the environment by doing a law degree, um, which I found really interesting and covered um, lots of modules in sort of environmental law based, international law based modules. Wow. I, I'm going to grasp you up here because you, cause you said before we start recording, it's like, yeah, I have to, yeah, I apologize, Kit. Like, I didn't end up <laughs> taking geography because I'm like, but then you, I was like, but then I did this law degree and just found like tons of geography in it anyway. But it always happens. <laughs> yeah that's amazing so um so at what at what point of your law degree did you did you think to yourself you know what I can definitely feel that this is a way forward in order to you know push you know the necessary environment agenda so was there a was there a moment or did it creep in or did you kind of always know and it just reinforced that feeling um it was always the plan and um, doing a law degree um I was um yeah very torn between doing a geography degree or a law degree yeah I guess I um it became more apparent as my degree went along um, how powerful law is, how it can really like unite um, people and action. I have to say, you know, it's there's 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 a very hostile climate out there at the moment with regards to, you know, LGBTQ rights, for example. And mm. um, and I want to give a shout out to um, to the Good Law Project, um, because they are really they are a prime example of what you just said. You know, they they stand for environmental protection, you know, that and um, you know, strong with their, their advocation of human rights and, and especially LGBTQ rights and things like that. So and and I feel comforted on a personal level that those kind of people are out there and you know, and they're doing and they're using the law for the for the right reasons. Has someone ever said to you or for or did you ever get a reaction from someone when you said doing a law degree that maybe someone reacted a bit snidely like oh you're gonna be one of those like barristers solicitors that tries to get like a someone off like in a courtroom or something like that I don't oh, know if you've yeah. ever had that you've had that reaction all the time yeah you're gonna be um, like one of these evil lawyers yeah or people would say like oh you're too nice to be doing law <laughs> <laughs> and things like that <laughs> oh dear I'm just now thinking of you running down that left wing and like being very tenacious. It's like, uh, you don't know a thing. <laughs> you can be a very, very nice person, a very kind person, but you can be tenacious and you can be, as you said, you know, the out, you can be outraged. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, before I forget to say so, Johanna, thank you so much for just that little vulnerable exposure that, that you said about, you know, saying that you did, have suffered from anxiety and you've have felt very very anxious about about things environmental stuff and I do remember actually a few years ago you know you reaching out and out out of the blue and it was lovely you know just saying hey you know I'm a little bit I just need need some words of advice support and and uh at the time you didn't you didn't know at the time that I was also suffering from quite a lot of anxiety myself but I think it was a lovely little thing that that lovely exchange that we had and to talk about it and I think a lot more people now are talking about it so I just want to say thank you for 
not not reaching out to me personally, but thank you for reaching out and talking about your anxiety. If you've got any words of advice for anybody listening that kind of feels, uh, you know, they they've got this climate anxiety, this eco anxiety, ecophobia. I know there's so many words for it now because it's such a endemic phenomenon now. Have you got any words of advice to anybody? Well, firstly, I think I just had to remember that the reason I was feeling so anxious and um, overwhelmed by it is because I cared so much. I love like nature and the environment and it's because I love it so much that I was feeling this anxiety. Um, Mm. I think you need that um, fear and you need that anxiety, but it can be used in a good way to... Um, do positive things and um, yeah if it's channeled in the right way I think it can be really positive positive. Um, like it's given me a really a focus um, and now I feel really happy with what I'm doing and um, I really love the master, masters I'm studying over time it is hard but I've just surrounded myself with people who um, a are supportive and b sort of feel the same way and they, they are out there I know it can be hard yeah. to find the people but they are out there. <laughs> there. There are plenty of us out there, and and yeah, it's. Uh, I've already given her a shout out actually on the podcast, and that's like, uh, for example, Clover Hogan. Who, congratulations, mm-hmm. Clover. Who's just you know you've. Um, um, I don't know Clover personally that well, but we've worked with each other a couple of times, and congratulations on Clover on your TED talk, which is absolutely incredible. So anybody, if you just now, if you just type in Clover Hogan TED. Uh, you'll get her talk about climate anxiety and and how to turn that into. Um, and I always quote clover on this how you turn anxiety into agency and i think you're a a prime example of taking that mantra and it's absolutely fantastic and um and there'll be a few things coming out i mean now when people are listening to this it will be the time where we're getting a lot closer to cop 26 Mm -hmm. and i'll be doing uh with some work with uh project change at the uea i'll be doing some work about climate anxiety and how to for and i'll be doing a workshop for young people and and a teacher training um, which will turn you know get more johannas people who are more <laughs> empowered and inspired and it could be a big problem you know but you know what we're going to do our damn best and we're going to be proud of what we do and um and you know and that's it that's what we can do in the big big things like this and i i think i still hold hope on a, another shout back to episode three uh david alcock that word again david hope yep hopeful geography we got it on there trying to you see i'm trying to link everybody up now <laughs> let's Go a bit random now. Okay. And we're going to do a little bit of uh, jog on. If you're listening to for the very first time, and Johanna's the first guest you listen to, you've got a great guest to listen to, haven't you, for the first time? But if you don't know what jog on is, is that I will give Johanna five topics that she has no idea what they are. Just to confirm, Johanna, I've not told you any of these topics. In no. Advance. No. Don't have a clue. <laughs> 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 so and um and then basically Johanna gets the chance to pass on two of them uh but she's got to talk about three of them and by saying jog on to ones that she want to talk about and take a hike for those she doesn't now I'm looking at the list this random generated list and actually um I think it's gone a bit easy on you to be honest <laughs> don't say that I've got pressure to do well now <laughs> right do you have anything to say or you want to comment on any tour on athletics yeah, I mean, jog on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I think athletics is an amazing sport. Um, I mean, amazing, um, yeah, I guess sport, because it's so wide ranging. You have the throwers, the high jumpers, the sprinters, the long distance runners. It really tests the human human body in lots of different ways. Um, but also, I think it really has a power to unite people as well, because you have um long distance runners are very different from shot putters you have um heptathletes who can do a bit of everything um yeah i think it's a very it's an accessible sport as well which i think also adds to the diversity of it almost lamenting of the of the of the happy days of london 2012 aren't oh. we? Like, we imagine we, we just remember how uniting that was for for us as, as, a, as a country and as, as people and and you know, not just not just the excitement over the Olympics itself, but the, like, the excitement over the Paralympics as well, mm. um, which is absolutely amazing. And seeing all these like incredible athletes who have overcome some kind of 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 physical disability or even mental, because I think it, 
correct me if I'm wrong, Jenna, but there's even, isn't there categories for... I think for, there are, really yeah. Difficult uh, disabilities as well, which is amazing. And that's the way it should be, because you're absolutely right. Everybody can therefore access it if if they so wish to. And and yeah, and I, I was lucky. Did you did you go to the Olympics at all? Did you... Um, I watched the triathlon in Hyde Park. And right. I, we got tickets to the Paralympics. Um, yeah, that was so good. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. The atmosphere was amazing. And actually, there was quite a few uh, students from, from our school there because I, I bumped into no fewer than three students just walking <laughs> around, you know, at the Olympics. But yeah, I I saw the judo and I saw one of the uh, football matches in Wembley. Oh, yeah. And the, the Olympic torch relay actually went right past my house when no I was way. living in Norwich. Yeah. And so actually, my 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 wife was on her way to work to Norfolk County Council. So I just like kind of walked with her to the end of the road, saw the Olympic band, and she just went off to work. And I went back home. <laughs> <laughs> this is random. Second topic is pharmacies. Um, take a hike. <laughs> yeah, pharmacies. Right. Okay. Right. Now, this is where it gets interesting because this is, again, total random. <laughs> Clowns. Right. Jog on. I'll give it a, I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, clowns. Go on, then. Well, I think clowns are quite um, dividing. <laughs> are they? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, lots of people are really scared of clowns. Um, and then on the, the absolute, absolute flip side, you have people who find them really funny. They're kids entertainers. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. Clowns are quite interesting. Um, I don't know any like the history of clowns or anything like that like how did clowns even come yeah. about yeah that actually, i'm really really okay yeah I, I, I want people to tweet us and tell us anybody out there who do that because um I, it's, it's, I, I i try and get the opportunity to lean into my microphone right and i'm just i'm just thinking do you want a balloon <laughs> <laughs> that's what people think of when they think of clowns you know that 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 movie oh i've just given myself the chills now um and yeah, and of course, we always have that stereotypical clown face, you know, with the red nose and stuff. But of course, there's so many different types of clowns as well. Yeah. Well, I feel like nowadays people often think of clowns as quite scary. But then it's like used in sort of every day. Like if you're funny, like, oh, you're such a clown. Yeah. Um, so maybe it came from them actually trying to be funny and then people just found them really freaky. <laughs> <sighs> well, the fourth uh, topic, which is... For a geography podcast, earthquakes. You want to take a gamble on the last one, or do you want to talk about earthquakes and take a gamble on missing out on the last one? I'll talk about earthquakes. Okay, jogging on on earthquakes. Well, I mean, it does throw me back to my um, geography classroom days. <laughs> um, but um, I actually find I love learning about earthquakes when I was at school. Um, partly because my family live on near the San Andreas Fault. Um, and, oh, no, I've forgotten the year it was. Maybe early 1990s, there was a huge earthquake. It might have been late 80s, I'm not sure. My aunt lives out in the desert, um, so, like, right on the fault, and the whole supermarket and all the um, freeways around her completely collapsed. Oh, um, but obviously it was the night of the Super Bowl, <laughs> so no one was there. Um, so very few people died, um, which I always find amazing. Like, what are the chances? <laughs> yeah, right. I found it. Yeah, it was 1994. So um, the North, and there was actually another one in 1989 as well. So there was two, but this, the 1994 was a magnitude 6.7 blind thrust earthquake that occurred on the annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday on January the 17th and it was at four hmm this might not have been about the one with the super bowl actually because oh, it no. was this this occurred at 4 30 in the morning so I don't think you'd be watching the uh super bowl at that. No. so it might have been the 1989 one it could have been yeah the other um funny thing about earthquakes I always think of is um my grandpa built an extension on the back of the house so a classic like Californian house doesn't have an upstairs so to um <laughs> So to expand, he built sort of like a corridor and then an extra bedroom and bathroom on the back of the house, um, but completely done by himself, didn't get any experts in. Um, and then there was an earthquake and my grandma was like, where's grandpa? And he was outside lying on his side, um, 
looking at the corridor because you could see it like um, moving in the earthquake. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's quite funny. Everyone else is trying to hide under a table or whatever and he was outside (laughs) watching his house in the earthquake. That is so cool. Oh, you reminded me. Did I do that thing with you when you were in year seven? So year seven, everybody is sixth grade, um, 11 year old, 11 to 12 year olds, where I, where you like literally destroyed, well, sort of destroyed my classroom. Yeah, I remember that. Go on, you tell everybody then. Oh, you're testing me now. Um, all I remember is we ended up like under the tables. Um, uh, everything was just chaos. Um, yeah. And it like there'd been an earthquake had hit Framingham High School. <laughs> I tell you what, cause what, yeah, cause what we, yeah, that's right. We did that one where we had to evacuate the building, and then five or six students pretended oh, that was it. to yeah. get to get stuck. And then I was outside, like in complete drama mode, like lining yeah. you up, like go right, okay, where's? I'm like, oh my god, where's where's such and such? Where's? I'm like, oh, and they're like, we got to go back and get. No, we're not allowed to go back in the building. It could collapse at any time. We got to wait for the all cl- all that kind of stuff. And then we go back into the classroom. Of course, the the students were planted. And there were tables all over the place. There was bags all over the place. They've, they had, they had carefully tipped like computer monitors over and stuff like that. And, but they, but they were instructed to not move anything dangerous or big. And yeah, and then all of you lot would come back in the classroom. Oh my God. I'm pretty sure I was one of the ones who had stayed in the classroom. That's why I remember, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I don't think very many teachers would allow their students to trash a classroom <laughs> on purpose. But yeah, that was loads of fun. And, um, yeah, I miss those kind of things. I miss those kind of things. But um, the, the one thing I do caution a bit about now, of course, is that you've got to have the juxtaposition with, with that all that exciting kind of stuff. You do have to follow it up with the kind of the stories to say, okay, well, if that really did happen, happen, you know, you would have been anxious for your friends. You would have been scared. You would have been worried. You know, you would whether they were injured and things like that. And and so you've got to bring that that real you know realism and humanity into it because we do love like the the fireworks of volcanoes and the and the amazement of the earthquakes and stuff like that but we obviously got to be mindful that they can cause tragedy but um i think you can learn about those things with a bit of fun you know a bit of healthy fun so um with respect but that was that's definitely a treasured memory um uh, doing that with <laughs> the year sevens every every year right the last topic it was beekeeping actually now your family actually have an allotment, so I thought you might have been able to talk about beekeeping. But unfortunately, Johanna, we've uh, no. <laughs> we've left that one off. But um, but yeah, just we might as well just make a mention of that because your your uh, parents do have an allotment, and uh, whenever you come visit here in Norfolk, you have a little bit of a a dig around. And did, did you did your brother join in as well? Well, actually, yeah. At the moment, my parents are in California, so this weekend, oh, um, me and my brother are headed down. We've been instructed to look after the allotment whilst they're away. <laughs> um, so, Paisha, I hope you're doing all right and uh, you're having fun listening to your to your sister, and uh, yeah, and to your parents. It's um, absolutely wonderful to be talking to Johanna again, and I hope you are doing well over there in California. I bet you miss miss your children dearly because they are wonderful, wonderful human beings. Right, we're going to come to the end now, Johanna. Unfortunately. Um, but eh, we, you know, we can still chat for a bit longer afterwards. <laughs> but for the listeners, um, we'll end up now, of course, with um, we are all geographers, where we are trying to challenge each guest to link a word to geography. So last week we had Al Snow, and they were given the word music by Jess Tipton, Doctor Jess Tipton, and they did a pretty good job with that. Now Al has given us what might may seem like a, a quite obvious simple word but i'm actually looking forward to seeing what you say about this because um there are so many different ways you can approach this to geography so al has given you the word plants so when you're ready you just make a start well so the first thing i think of when i think of geography we'll start there is learning about places um and how places are different to each other and plants I think are one way you can learn about a place because it's such a huge variety of plants growing in everywhere all over the world every place you go there'll most likely be a plant um <laughs> and um so Sheffield has different plants to Norwich Norwich has different plants to California um, and I just think it's a great way to learn about a place <laughs> I mean yeah of course you can identify a place you know using the the, the the flora and 
there are plants that happen at own certain places because of their climate, their microclimate, or plants can represent cultures as well, you know, and uh, and there's there's flowers that represent different countries like uh, the thistle in Scotland. And... I don't know how like much detail to go into because it's like on the one hand so <laughs> obvious, but on the other hand it's like oh, <laughs> totally. So then. We have um, our next guest coming up um, next week and you have got to challenge them with a word yourself. And, you know, you don't have to go easy. You, you can. It's it's a word of your choice. It could be something you're passionate about. It could be something we've talked about. Or it could be something completely random. It is totally up to you. So what word do you think you're going to go for? Well, this is really hard because since I met you when I was in year seven, you've absolutely drilled into me that everything's related to geography. <laughs> um, no, I didn't, did I? <laughs> I remember at one of those um, after school sessions, we had to make a little box um, about what geography meant to us. Oh, um, oh. And someone, I can't remember who it was, just put a mirror in the box and then was like, oh. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. I can't remember who that was now, but that was amazing. And like, this is actually quite profound. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, but they did a great job of explaining what, what why they did that in there. So yeah. Ah. Oh, okay. Right. So, something random then. <laughs> something random. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I just was thinking about Sheffield as a city, um, and in my opinion, it's quite a. I might be giving it away here, to be honest, but um, it's a bit of a contrasting city. So I think I'm going to go with contrast um, and see how they can relate that to geography. That is a great word. Contrast. Right. OK, so um, that's going to be a really, really interesting word for the person to come up to. I think they can approach that in a, a couple of different ways. I know who I'm talking to next, of course. They have such an amazing, amazing job. And I think they're definitely going to be able to talk about contrast. Let's just say um, that because I know this person as well you know even even if they could talk about the shirts they wear and then they could be able to talk about contrasts <laughs> right um Johanna so this has been absolutely amazing so we've we've given a shout out to the place that you're on placement of eco vibe we've given a shout out to your brother and to your parents is there anyone else you want to say hi to well I guess if there's any ex Framingham L students out there listening <laughs> Give them, give them a shout out for all the memories in the geography classroom we had there. Oh, any any Frammies out there? Yeah, and um, you know any teachers listening? You know, you know as well as I do, don't you? You feel so proud of your of your of the students, even when they grow up, grow up, and uh, you never get that rid of that feeling. So yeah, oh, why not? Say hi to all the Frammies. Hi Frammies, <laughs> miss you, really do. Um, Okay, and so if uh, anybody wants to connect with you to say like, oh, we're quite interested in the work that Johanna does, we want to learn more about the sustainability or stuff like that, where can they find you on social media? Um, so on Twitter, um, I think I'm Johanna28. Um, yeah, that's the main sort of social media I use. I don't, I'm not a big social media user. To yeah. Use. yeah, no problem at all. But if pe people can just see the kind of things there and... Uh, yeah. Yep. To you and like have a look at the wonderful pictures you take of the Peak District or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Johanna, um, I, oh my goodness, this has been so so lovely. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted not just to catch up with you, but I'm also delighted that other people have got to listen to us catching up because it's it's for if you're not a teacher and you don't work with young people, everybody out there listening, um this really does give you kind of the sense of the pride that a lot of us teachers feel in in what we do and, and why we really really do it for the right reasons and you know and, and when we see the journey of like people like Johanna and what 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 they go through and you do feel that sense of pride and and Johanna is a perfect example that we need to put more faith you know in, in young people and trust them um, and do better by them in this world so uh, Johanna I'm, I, I will say it publicly I'm very very proud of you um, and it's just been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. So thank you so much. No, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And um, thanks for keeping in touch so well over all these years. <laughs> it really has been my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favourite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep geogging.